I'm just going to kind of zip through a few slides here and then hang on, let me get rid of. Um, okay, so you know, we're here for there's this is a four part um, session. So the reason why we're doing the manufacturing, uh, that cybersecurity for manufacturing is, is several reasons. One is we took a poll uh, of, uh, of faculty that we work with across the state and they were interested in this idea. Also, Lewis, who's on the uh, on the call, brought it up that said, uh, you know, a lot of the technicians that work in manufacturing could use this kind of a resource. So uh, this would all be recorded. It is being recorded. Uh, I think Ron may talk a little bit about it, but he's also talking about redoing this uh, in, a, in, a, in another format uh, and putting it up in YouTube. Although we will probably put it up in YouTube as well. This, the Zoom call, I think Ron wanted to take it up to another level, which will be great. And he can talk about that if, if he wants. So a couple other events that we're doing, uh, um, Today we're doing the uh, the top one there, cybersecurity for manufacturing technicians. But a, we're doing a series of about 11 professional developments over the next um, the next uh, uh, six months or so. This is one of the 11, so 10 more after this. Uh, the next one is on um, January 19th, and it's about how to develop local arch articulations to increase enrollment in college programs. So that's something that I've done at FSCJ in the past, and it's a really good way to increase enrollment uh, into your college programs. Uh, also, uh, how to create a work-based learning, how to create work-based learning opportunities is February 1st. February 22nd is recruiting best strategy or recruiting strategies, best practices. Um, and then on uh, 418, we're doing one on creating video. Excuse me. Uh, we're doing one on creating videos using classroom say? projects and student success. Different stories. colors. Okay, all right, got you muted. Thank you for, for muting yourself. Um, okay, so all right, next slide, please. Oh, I guess um, I guess um, we didn't put the, you know, how to find the link, but I guess, Teresa, they would, I guess if they found this one, what would you tell them to, how to find the link uh, to the other PDs? I can put it in the chat. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, this is a really exciting one. So this is a two-day in-person event on January 5th and 6th um, in College of Central Florida. So this is this this particular cybersecurity across disciplines will be a great event, and it's going to be taught by uh, some folks out of uh, Washington, Whatcom, out of Washington State, who have a a huge national security agency grant um, and an NSF grant to help promote uh, manufacturing awareness and training. So if you're interested in that, I think uh, Teresa may post that one as well. Thank you, Teresa. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, real quick. So this is the, uh, so we are FLATE. Um, FLATE is the Florida Advanced Technological Education Center. Um, the team that we have, you've met three of us. So I'm Ernie Friend. Um, you met Daniele and Teresa. And I don't, I didn't see Marilyn, although she might be here, but Marilyn Barger um, is the senior education advisor. I am taking over her role as the executive director. She, um, uh, you know, uh, created Flate and ran and ran Flate for over 18 years. Uh, now she's still with us, fortunately, working on a lot of grants and special projects. So we have a great team. Um, you know, well, the next few slides will talk briefly about what we do. And I'll go real fast, Ron. I don't want to burn up too much of your time. Sorry. So uh, what what Flake does is we drive Florida's world class manufacturing workforce education and training. And how do we do that? Uh, we do that through uh, curriculum reform and development. I'm not going to read all the items there, but uh, we work with uh, the educators around the state um, to you know to support uh, standards and benchmarks. We work with industry to understand what they need, and then we bring that back. We, it's called the ET, ET leadership team. It's a, a set of uh, four people that um, four people that um, that, that slide slipped on me, Teresa. Um, so we work with uh, oh I, I, I see why you, why you did that. So we work with a team um, um, of uh, a, a leadership team, but we also work with all the educators. So we do a ET forum twice a year, uh, which we get about 50 or 60 educators from across the state that are teaching the ET degree, the engineering technology degree. Um, we also do outreach and student recruitment. Uh, we do a, quite a bit of that, just trying to help um, 
you know, educators and the public learn more about uh, manufacturing and the great career options that are available. We also do professional development. That's, that's what we're doing now. So we do a series of professional development opportunities for educators to help them understand and get up to speed on some of the latest technologies. All right, and what Teresa was trying to, to show us is this is the schools that we work with. Um, you know, we work with, these are the colleges that we work with. Let me back that up. So these are the schools that have an ET degree uh, at some level. We work with colleges, um, universities, tech colleges, high schools, middle schools, anybody that we can to help promote um, careers in, um, in manufacturing. Uh, but for the most part, we focus on, on the community colleges. But like I said, our new focus will be tech colleges uh, as we move forward as well. Okay, so what man, you know, how, um, how we help manufacturers is we, um, you know, we provide information to them about, um, about the different opportunities uh, to meet and connect with colleges, um, resources to prepare for manufacturing outreach events. So we have a big push for manufacturing uh, day, year, month. Um, so we spend a lot of time working with industry on promoting those. All right, next slide, please. Okay, opportunities to engage. So these are some of the things that the industry can be engaged in to help promote manufacturing. Um, so visit classrooms, participate, you know, with us in uh, different um, um, educator awards, judge and recognition, uh, help uh, update the curriculum, uh, be on, we're just creating, uh, Maryland's creating a statewide advisory committee, so they participate in that, and then host, host as many events and spend as much time as they can at schools, because that makes a difference. The more students hear about opportunities uh, in manufacturing, the more likely they will be to look at that as a career choice, not just them, but their parents. Okay, so this is just a list of, um, uh, so our, oops, I lost my Zoom. Huh. Oh, something happened. Can you guys still hear me? I thought you were gonna turn it over to Ron at this point. Oh, yeah, no, I think there was, yeah, I think there was one more slide, but um, anyway, so uh, that's a good, a good point. So I will turn it over to Ron. I'm probably running way over time. But I, do, I want to introduce uh, Ron Eglin, uh, professor at uh, Daytona, uh, not, not a professor, uh, he works at Daytona State College, super, super smart guy, nice guy, and an expert in cybersecurity. And now, Ron, sorry I took 15 minutes of your time, but I'll hand it back over to you. All right, well, I'll get, uh, no worries, I'll get started. I can easily do this to see. I'm going to find the, uh, the slideshow right there, throw that on share. So you should all be able to see that. You are screen sharing. So, um, so I'm Dr. Ron Eglin. I'm, uh, I'm a, I'm, I am a professor. I'm the professor and chair of uh, both engineering and IT. So I we kind of had that same role. And so I, I, I cover both, both parts. And this is a part of a four part. And the other parts will be, will be I, I've got the ability to modify those based on what the audience is looking to what they need. So. Um, Let's see if I can actually now make the slideshow progress correctly. So um, what we're going to do is um, we're going to look at cybersecurity specifically in the manufacturing arena. Even th but that's kind of um, you can't just do cybersecurity and manufacturing because general topics in cybersecurity do overlap into manufacturing, and manufacturing gives you that unique. Um, what's unique to some industries is that you've got both IT and OT, the information and operational technologies, both have to coexist in the same environment, which is one of the reasons why there's a certain challenge to this. And we're going to go through the, we're going to really talk about why cybersecurity has to be in that manufacturing sector, um, why companies have to worry about it or, or have to plan for it. And then what we're going to really do is we're gonna look at, probably do two things. One is look at how to create a plan for dealing with the cybersecurity issues in the manufacturing area. But, but since we have a lot of educators here, we're also gonna explore where we can put this into the curriculum. Where, where will it fit? And what type of stuff can you get out to the actual students that are in the uh, ET and, uh, programs? So, uh, first thing is looking at, you know, why is this important? So 
the last major survey done in the manufacturing industry uh, to see what level of incidences you have. Now we do have other ways of getting this information. One is, is that there, there are case management reporting systems. However, they're ad hoc. There's no requirement for anybody who is a victim of a cybersecurity attack to report it in the manufacturing sector. Some sectors, there's a little bit more um, regulation, but the manufacturing sector does not have, is not really regulation driven. There's an NIST standard that they use, but that's what we have to work with. So this last survey, however, did open up a lot of information about what's actually going on. And 40% of the manufacturers surveyed had actually dealt with a cybersecurity incident. And the interesting thing there is that they were about the same level of each of those. Realized that you can have an unauthorized access, which leads into an operational disruption. So there are these, these aren't ex mutually exclusive. These are um, types of things that can actually occur. The, there's two biggies there, though, that you really have to worry about. The, upper, the yeah. unauthorized access is kind of a given if you're dealing with a manufacturer, if you're dealing with a cybersecurity incident. But the two things that you see that are happening are the operational disruptions. They're you know, either getting in and stopping production, uh, disrupting production. And the other one, which is a big one, is intellectual property theft. So the impact is relatively significant. The IoT-related incidences are primarily, we're really looking at manufacturing with the, when we talk about IoT, which is Internet of Things, because many of the types of equipment that you see in manufacturing actually do classify as IoT devices. So you're looking, you're looking at an impact that isn't insignificant, and then looking at the financial impact of a data breach, which is not, that is not a number that's limited to manufacturing, but the financial impact of a data breach at seven and a half million is also, that's a relatively significant amount that you've got a high level of risk there. So one of the things that in the manufacturing arena, um, looking at cybersecurity risks is to really take cybersecurity based risks and roll those into the risk profile of manufacturing overall. So manufacturing, uh, especially managers deal with a significant amount of risk in all sorts of areas and mm -hmm. four primary categories. Question? Nope, I guess not. So um, operational, strategic, financial, and compliance. And if you're in the manufacturing sector, you understand these types of risks. An operational risk, any decision that you make in the manufacturing sector, um, specifically dealing with equipment or what you're going to actually do with the equipment or what you're going to make, is, an, is both an operational and a strategic risk. Um, you're running a business. You need to make money. Um, so those pieces all tie together. And because much of manufacturing is regulation driven, you've also got that last one of a compliance risk. Well, adding to this set of risks, you've now got a fifth risk, which is dealing with um, the risks that are associated with the cybersecurity profile of your organization. So, when we talk manufacturing, so I'm, what I'm going to do a lot of is I'm going to switch from engineering to IT to cybersecurity to engineering to manufacturing because each of the people that have expertise in those specific areas looks at each of these things a little bit differently. So what I, I'm going to do is try to give you an idea of how the different people in the different sectors look at the decisions that they make and how they do them. So one of the major initiatives that you see in the manufacturing is the push towards what we call smart manufacturing. We call it I-4. Um, there's, there's different terminology, but the bottom line for that is, is that the, 
manufacturers are going to spend money to make changes to the way that they do business and the way that they manufacturing things. And the move towards smart manufacturing means move to more connected devices. With that, you get some payoffs. You have higher levels of productivity that you can get. You can increase the quality of the product that you're getting out. One of the other things that I didn't say here was also um, the customizability and the flexibility of being able to make changes quickly are some of the payoffs that you're going to get from moving from more traditional manufacturing, which is essentially isolated pieces of equipment to things that are networked and integrated. But what they carry with them is also increased risk. And when we talk about financial liability, many of these moves are expensive. So the decision to move from a simple plant floor where you might have five or six CNC operators, each working independently on product uh, developing products to something where you've actually got the whole thing networked and integrated with other types of equipment costs money. So when you make that financial jump, you're gonna also wanna look at what the payoffs, but you now have actually added another dimension of risk because now you've got devices that we might call smart devices, but really what we do is refer to them as IoT devices, but they're connected. And anytime something's connected, this is, this is beyond the sneaker net, and I'm gonna use a term here called sneaker net, for those who don't know what that means is, many times you'll update or you'll work with a device simply by getting a, well, and I'm gonna, this is, I got a thumb drive, but that, that's only one method. A lot of these older devices, you may be putting information onto a floppy disk and going over and using that to update some of the actual the, you know, older pieces of hardware. Also, you've got these older pieces of hardware that you might be retrofitting with equipment that is more modern. So that sets up an overall environment. And what I really want everybody to get from this is if you're in the IT world or the cybersecurity world, to understand how the person who's in that decision-making capacity as a manufacturer is looking at this specific decision, what they're getting out of it and the risk that they're taking. So when we talk to those types of, those people who are making those decisions, what are they worried about? And if you, there's, there's, there's all sorts of issues here because there's no issue that's really a small issue. So for example, if you're dealing in manufacturing, one of the paramount issues that all manufacturers deal with is safety. Safety is considered in the manufacturing realm a high level of risk because of the repercussions of safety issues. A safety issue can shut down the plant. Okay, now that's not the only way that you can shut down a plant. You've also got other ways, operational disruptions, or you know, sometimes this might be based on a cybersecurity threat, but it may be just based on the plant not being able to get specific supplies or a piece of equipment not working. So when you look at the different types of risks from the perspective of the manufacturer, these are the things that they're worried about. Can somebody come in and change a piece of equipment and affect the quality of the output of what they're getting from this? Can they cause a safety issue? Can they stop production directly? Another big one, which is intellectual property theft. Because one of the things that you want to be able to do as a manufacturer is protect how you, what you make and how you make it. So again, this is going towards the mindset of the people that are working in the IT to understand where the risks of OT are, are, are at. And, and before I guess I go any further, I should make sure that everybody understands what I mean when I say IT and OT. Information technology, for those people who live in the information technology world, they have a pretty good understanding. Those are the people that run the computers and the network the things that actually distribute information and allow 
people to do the work in that in that area. But OT lives is part is a, is paramount in the manufacturing world. That's operational technology. That's the equipment that you use to get the job done that you need to do to make stuff. And they run differently. IT and OT aren't the same thing. IT does not typically run OT, even though there, there's a tremendous amount of, there might be a, there might be a tremendous amount of overlap in OT, but a CNC machine is a piece of, is an OT asset. It might also be considered an IT asset, but the reality in the manufacturing mindset is that that piece of equipment is needed to get the job done. It's part of the OT, the operational technology necessary for what they need to do to get to do the job. So let's look at some of the issues that are that are that are here. Now, we're going to go into two mindsets at once right now. The people in the manufacturing world are dealing with the concept of operational technology and the people that are in the IT world are dealing with the concepts of information technology. In the IT world, because I, I do live in both, in the IT world, most of the time IT has a IT manager and a centralized responsibility. That's just a natural thing. Who is your CIO and how do you manage all your IT assets? And that usually has an organizational structure for that. OT may not work that way at all. Individual pieces of equipment in different parts of the manufacturing process may be under completely different levels of responsibility. So that is mindset. Those guys are responsible for that machine. That's how you think. Now, looking at that machine, those machines that we're now going to go into the OT world, those machines, you may have four or five different pieces of equipment sitting side by side from four or five different vendors that make it with four to five different software systems, all of which are proprietary. That's the OT world. In the IT world, we try to make everything be interoperable. We do deal with systems integration where we've got to get systems to work with each other in the IT world. But the, one of the primary objectives of the IT world is to provide a level of interoperability. The last thing is, is that that concept of patching and update. I, you know, we get the notifications from IT is we're going to shut the systems down for between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. to apply some patches. And that's a natural workflow in IT. They do it all the time and, they're, and, and they know how to do it and they've got an entire protocol for that. But let's go back into the OT world where you're looking at how they think. Now you're saying, okay, we need to apply some operational technology changes to the equipment. It may be software-based. It may be hardware-based. It may be changing the equipment to do slightly different job. But that's their world of patching and updating, which is different from the IT world. So there is... A disconnect, well, I wouldn't say there's a disconnect, but there are two different worlds. And in a well-run organization, they have an understanding of each other, but that's not necessarily always the case. So let's look at some of the challenges that we've got, that we've got to deal with. In the IT world, we do patches and updates on a regular basis. And hopefully those things occur with minimal side effects. You don't want to be shutting down your entire IT systems and your, and your email and all that while people are actually using them at work. But let's look at the, um, and because it's disruptive to your, to your business processes. But let's look at the update challenges that are dealing with on the OT side, where making those changes might involve taking down portions of the plant for a significant period of time, and that's a direct loss of revenue. So the people running in the manufacturing side look at that from like, I cannot be taking down critical pieces of equipment to apply a patch in a situation where it might disrupt 
the ability of that piece of equipment to be used and make money. Those systems might be old, they might be proprietary, um, and they might be using, and this is why you've got it in a lot of fun with the IT, they may be using communications protocols from 15 years ago. So the big risk in looking at these updates with these manufacturing systems that sit on the floor for a long time, think about this, a, you know, a piece of equipment in a, on a manufacturing floor may live there for 20 to 25 years, working perfectly well for all that period of time. You don't find pieces of equipment that live in the IT world that have been there for 25 years. So, um, and, and think back in the IT world, what would happen if you had to update a piece of equipment that was 25 years old? I mean, they're not gonna have a CD even on it. They're not gonna take thumb drives. They're gonna go back to an older piece of technology and have to use that to do this. Well, this is the everyday life of the people who live in the operational technology world on the manufacturing side. So what is the challenge? Bottom line, what is the challenge that you look at if you're dealing with OT on the operational technology? Well, if you don't have the cybersecurity in place, if you haven't looked at what those risks are, if you haven't looked at how to mitigate those risks and ensure that everything is operate is going to is going to work and not be able to be taken over or hacked or, or broken into or stopped or disrupted, you've got a significant risk. But at the other side of that coin is going through and making those changes is challenging and potentially expensive. So that is where you've got to come from when you start thinking about how is this going to occur? Because the, when it comes down to ensuring the cybersecurity in manufacturing, it takes both the OT and the IT to do it. Now, where, what happens? Um, I'm going to be giving a session of case studies in one of the future sessions. But what actually occurs most commonly, and there really are three types of common attacks. Now, there's a commonality of those types of attacks, and one attack doesn't necessarily preclude the other attacks. Right this minute, the most common type of attack that you're seeing is a spear phishing attack that is being used to gain access into the IT infrastructure to set up a ransomware situation. So what that actually says is the bad guys are trying to get money from you. If a bad guy can get into your system by any means that they get in, hijack your systems, they're not necessarily going in there to cause havoc and cause massive operational disruptions, but ransomware is a massive operational disruption because if they can get into your system, they're gonna go after everything that they can get into once they get into the network itself. So a couple of very quick definitions. I'm gonna go, anybody from the IT side is gonna know this right at the, you know, spear phishing is, is exactly, well, they use the word pH, but spear phishing is exactly what it sounds like. It's a targeted attack on an individual to gain access into a system. And they're sophisticated. Now, some of the spear phishing attacks that have hit me have known, that have gone after me, have known all sorts of very pertinent and relevant information about me. Um, it, the most common, it comes to you as, as an email. I mean, some of them are really, are, are to the level of ridiculous. Um, you get an email that you need to log in immediately because people are buying things off of your Amazon, but the email isn't even coming from an Amazon address. That's a phishing attack. That isn't necessarily a spear phishing attack because it isn't very targeted, but realize that the hackers will that are looking for the very sophisticated attacks 
to, to, to launch a ransomware or to actually try to get in for true and operational disruption are going to research the employees of a company to get in. So they're going to have information about it. Now, once they get in, ransomware is essentially a malicious piece of code that will either encrypt or basically block you out of your own systems. And ransomware is simply saying, we're going to let you back in if you pay us money. So, you know, is there a financial thing that a you know, financial component of this? Oh, most definitely. And for manufacturing, this actually is the type of attack that, that we see most commonly. These aren't typically state-sponsored attacks. I have people that, that follow um, the, the cybersecurity world. There's hackers that do it to make money. There's hackers that do it as state-sponsored attacks. We have had state-sponsored attacks, typically on critical infrastructure, where they're, they're, the goal is disruption. The um, one of the common is to for intellectual property theft. I mean, I, I most people have probably read in the news how um, essentially China, which is one of the uh, state sponsored, um, will, will have people that will attempt to get into the systems to steal intellectual property. But that's another one. So, um, bottom line is we really want to keep everybody out, but it's good to understand. What some of these attacks are now, and if I if there is a demand for it, um, especially when I do the case studies, the case studies will get into specifics. When I say spear phishing, we're going to look at exactly what type of what what was actually the email, who it was sent to, why it was sent to, and how they researched the individual to get them to be vulnerable to that attack. So, if we look at, I mean, this is again aimed at the people from IT. If we look at the manufacturing side, where do the vulnerabilities lie? And now let's get out of the IT realm of the vulnerabilities, which are typically managed by IT. Getting into the networks, getting into that, and we'll talk about that, but that's, um, right now we're gonna look at where are the vulnerabilities directly in the manufacturing, which is unique to the manufacturing. So um, there's, a, there's these categories, and if you categorize them, and, and I've looked at, we've got different reports that look at these in different ways, but um, this, is a, this is how um, manufacturers can actually look at it and understand these, these categories. So when you're looking at where the vulnerabilities are, take the category and say, okay, what do we have? that is vulnerability, that is vulnerable. Anything that is networkable or sneaker netable is a vulnerability. So the most common one is simply the PCs and the databases, those things. Now you may have network and cloud services, which are maybe have the security that is managed externally by a network and a cloud service provider. But those are the places that the bad guys, the hackers will get in. With those specific vulnerabilities, you have specific threats that are associated with those vulnerabilities, such as in the engineering aspect of that, if they can get into the, into the PC or the servers where you've got the intellectual property, that is gonna be one of the biggest threats you're gonna have is theft of IP. But that's also a way to get into the network for the other types of things that you can do. And the standard solutions to those types of things, when you're dealing with the personal computers and databases and ser servers, the protocols that work for those are the same protocols that you see when you're doing IT-based security. Flowing patches, security updates, having correct security protocol, and making sure that your users are educated against the threats that they're going to have. That's IT, and that's, those are IT, usually IT-managed. When you're looking at some of these other, uh, these other aspects, like in this case, materials requirement planning, well, one of the biggies when you're talking about material requirements is talking about the supply chain. So one of the pieces of the supply chain, especially when you've got integrated supply chains, is if the provider 
is a vul the, the provider is a vulnerability. Your suppliers of the supplies you need to do, especially with integrated supply, may be a vulnerability. So you have to look at that one. Moving on, now we're looking at equipment that might be that is different than the PCs that are typically managed by IT, but now you've got pieces of equipment which are networked assets. So any piece of equipment, especially advanced manufacturing equipment, which is typically going to be networked. Um, I know that all the PLCs that we have over here, um, even though we don't use them as operational assets for making things, we teach students on it, but they're all on the network. So they're all protected. They're also segmented off the network so that we actually have a secondary firewall around those assets. Um, that isn't specifically for any reason that we're not tremendously worried about people hacking into the PLCs at the college, but um, we, we segment them because we've actually got more worries of issues, the fact that we're actually doing firmware updates and the students are on that, that we won't, don't want them disrupting the network outside of that, that um, um, firewall. But uh, in the case of an actual manufacturer, you've got both of those. Performance management, um, again, this is just, this is primarily access to the data and the software that is um, running that, that, the data, which may be databases, but um, the performance management goes beyond just database assets to the pieces of software that allow you to get a uh, real time um, uh, access to what's going on in the plant itself so that you can manage the performance of, of the production line. And then the last one being the energy management. Um, and we all actually have this because um, believe it or not, one of the ways to get into a building is through the control systems, even the HVAC control systems of the building. Now, one, now that, I, and that's all, those are the categories. Now, if you're an OT or an IT person, Go back and look at, you know, going back and I'm going to cover all this in a tremendous amount of depth because we've got case studies on each of these and you have to develop a plan for how you're going to protect all this. And I've covered a whole lot of pieces of equipment, not just your standard PC servers and databases, but every single thing that exists on that plant floor. And if you go into any manufacturing plant, unless they've you know, they're using a single supplier for every piece of equipment that they have, they've probably got multiple pieces of equipment from multiple suppliers. And thinking about just having a patching plan to be able to get the pieces of patches from multiple suppliers and keep the systems updated and patched, each of which is probably going to have a completely different methodology for applying the patches, you've now got a system that's tremendously complex. So what do you do? Well, one of the things that you um, can do is a full cybersecurity assessment. And you either have one or two situations that may occur here. You have the expertise to do a cybersecurity assessment in-house, or you can get a third-party vendor that has the expertise to do a cybersecurity assessment. The recommendation that has come in from, and this is from multiple people who do cybersecurity assessments, so you can take it with that as an understanding, is that you should have a cybersecurity assessment done typically on an annual basis on all OT environments, which basically means all the equipment, everything that you do, not just the IT side of it. Now, a lot of manufacturing plants also use third-party IT, um, you know, not necessarily in-house. And there are a number of companies that do both IT and OT. So you can get both of those into one package. So um, looking at this, you have to be able to deal with both of those environments. And, and just like if you're going to get a housekeeper to come over and clean your house, if you're going to be bringing in a third party um, person or, or, or firm to do your annual assessment of your OT environment, you need to prepare for that because you're gonna to need to know 
it's going to be obviously advantageous for you to have what are all the equipments, when were they purchased, what is the data on the equipment, who is the manufacturer, and who are the contacts with those manufacturers to get updates and everything on that prior to the third party people coming in. And a governance program. This is, this is actually one of the bigger deals because what if something happens? And in a manufacturing company, and, and, I've, and I talk to manufacturers quite a bit, and I, and if I ask them the question, if somebody were to get into your system and stop the operation of one of your pieces of equipment, what would you do? You know, what, what is this? Who can make decisions? And what decisions are you going to make? Do you even have a plan? Do you understand who the responsibilities chain for individual assets is? Because remember, when I talked about the OT environment, different pieces of equipment have many times different people that are responsible for that. So if you've got a plan for this, it's going to be taking all those things into consideration. Now, if you really um, have a big issue with insomnia, um, NISTIR -R 8183, which is the publication, I've got it right here, I've read the entire thing of it, um, covers every individual step, every piece of assessment for all these pieces, not every piece of equipment, but the process of every question that you need to ask everywhere along the way. So there is a specific regulation, uh, well, not specific, a specific set of guidelines in IST that does cover this. And um, I am going to cover that. I am, however, going to do a tremendous amount of of paraphrasing of all of the pieces that they have in it, because one is there's absolutely zero way I could cover everything that is in NISTIR in one hour. But what I can do is develop an overview of all the things that need to be done if you're gonna be following that. Um, so that, that's gonna be one of the future sessions we'll be talking about those. And before I go into this, let's just look at what are those basic steps we're gonna, um, Again, this is going to be what you actually take away from that session is knowing what the risks, know what the risks are. What is the risk is if one machine is disrupted, what is the risk to your operations? Have a program or a plan for dealing with those individual list risks. Have training so that everybody knows the steps that you're going to take if something occurs or how to prevent it. Have a well-documented understanding of your supply chain. And that is not just your supply chain as in, I'm documenting this is my supply chain, but what are the individual risks, not just to the supply chain get, um, causing a disruption locally, but what about a disruption in the supply chain itself? Have the ability to test your plan, even if it's a tabletop exercise, with just the people sitting around a table, something occurs. Anybody who's never gone through a tabletop, um, oper a, a tabletop um, operational plan of, of something that occurs, it's like playing Dungeons and Dragons, except that all of a sudden the master says that we're gonna go, somebody's hacked into this piece of equipment, what is everybody gonna do? Um, because it stopped working. So you have to have the ability to manage specific instruments um, and the last little piece of this is there's always the ability, once you understand the risks, to know what needs to be insured and at what level to deal with those risks. Remember, that's knowing what the risks are and what the probabilities are. And remember, the probabilities change as you mature your ability and you reduce the profile of yourself to attack and your ability to, and you increase your ability to respond. So um, I thought I had a, I must have thought, <laughs> I had a slide that was, go, oh, here it is. So just so you know where I'm going in the future with this, one is session number two, which is kind of the fun one, is actually going through specific case studies in manufacturing. I'm going to try to make this one interactive, where 
I'm going to set up a situation um, that's a true case study. I'm going to leave the names of the companies off, give an overview of, of the, 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 the manufacturing process, have something occurred that actually occurred, and look to see how everybody would look at to responding to that. Then session number three, um, the how-to guide to go with building your plan goes back to the two slides before where I said, here's all those pieces that are part of the plan. And you know, what's the more detail to go into that since I'm, um, I'm, I'm doing pretty good, Ernie. I'm, I'm staying on time very well. And then based on the, uh, the users, which we're gonna kind of keep eye of who's, who's attending these sessions is, are we gonna be beneficial to say, what can we implement into curriculum? And where can we implement it in our in, in manufacturing programs? Or do we need to actually go to the industry side and say, okay, here's more of what the people in the industry need to do? Now I can go back to this slide. So now I open it up. Everybody can, can breathe now. I hope I didn't go. I, I was trying to pace myself. Very good, Ron. Yeah, well, thank you, Ron. Good. That was a good start. Everybody keep in mind, we've got three more to go. So I don't, did you want to ask him any questions, Ron, to help you prepare for that fourth session you were talking about? Well, I think what, um, you know, everybody's going to get an opportunity to, um, and actually it would be good if you've got the chats, because I love the chats, give me a written record. Um, Go to the chats, and if you if you like, say you know that you want to specifically implement something in a specific class, that's good to know. Um, and if you're coming from the education side, I know where I know I'll know what school you're from, and I'll know what programs you have too. I have that information. I have data. <laughs> Uh, Ron, uh, this is Joel from uh, Manti Technical College, and uh, I just wanted to mention, uh, and I appreciate that, and that was very uh, informative, and, um, you know, as we're trying to get our hands around these Internet of Things, and they're, you know, being manufactured with uh, not a lot of uh, standards or, you know, benchmarks, and obviously they don't have the robustness to, um, to implement some type of, you know, security measure inside of them a lot of times. As we teach the program now, we touch a little bit on SCADA, a little bit on the uh, Internet of Things and how they are starting to infiltrate networks all around the world. And right now, the two key points we try to teach is to have some uh, appliance between your network and your sensitive data and these Internet of Things, if, if, if possible. And that uh, appliance, uh, uh, on top of that, um, you have some type of security wrapper that you would try to place on the data that, that Internet of Things is, is, is going into the network to go uh, either extract or to go uh, uh, place data into. Um, how, how, as these apparatuses or as these appliances are separating and segmenting the Internet of Things into the network and hopefully feeding some of these intelligent feeds in there, um, you know, as a... Uh, industry, you know, it's kind of hard as we are just now trying to develop these standards. And it reminds me so much of back in, you know, with Microsoft and Apple and as we've kind of evolved and how helpful these standards have become. Just curious on your input as to where you think we are with that. And if there's any other piece to this uh, that that we should uh, let our students know is, a, is another way to try to protect ourselves from these Internet of Things. Well, okay, so Joel, the, the one thing is, is the, the known versus the unknown. So when, um, look, if you read through some of the security and, and um, analyses that, um, which are hard to get hold of, but, you know, you, you just kind of have to dig, um, a, comp a typical manufacturer may come in and say, okay, we're going to go ahead and inventory what we think are the pieces of equipment that have a high, have a, at least some level of vulnerability. And they'll come back with 15, 20 pieces of equipment. And then, this, then the group will come in and do the security analysis and come back and say, no, you have 175. You've got way more than you thought you had. And um, so on the manufacturing side, it's getting a handle over every little thing. So in, in a simple example of this is, as soon as I walk into my building, and log into the local network with my cell phone, 
I've now got an internet appliance in my hand that is connected to the internal network. So, um, and in that case, that, that piece of equipment, which in this case is just a cell phone, but that piece of equipment is also transient. So the challenge that I've been seeing, um, you know, and this is from the reading of this, because I'm gonna actually, go, I'm, going, I'm planning on going to some manufacturers and looking at doing the risk asses assessments to see, you know, in real life where they're at is um, they, what they know they manage. What they don't know, they don't know to manage. And understanding the risks and the vulnerabilities of some of the pieces of equipment that they don't know are vulnerabilities. Now, those are probably many cases extremely low risk because you're talking about pieces of equipment that don't necessarily um, have an easy way to get into. But I can tell you after watching the latest um, one of the, the hackathon competitions where they were attacking the PLCs of, um, you know, the, the red team was attacking the PLCs of the blue team and finally broke into one of the PLCs, they were able to quickly propagate to, and actually gain full control over the PLC, that first PLC, and then propagate that to all the interconnected PLCs. Um, that one was interesting too. But what it showed me that is if one of those pieces of equipment, which was PLC controlled, was accessible, they all became accessible. And now you've got a chance for a high level of um, a very high potential of, of operational disruption. But in the, um, what the blue team failed to do was secure 100% of their equipment. They left one vulnerable that one gave them an insight to all of them. So showing me that, that if, you know, if you got access to one piece, they weren't able to get to anything else other than those PLCs though. So that, I mean, does that even answer, but do I kind of give yeah, you Yeah, no, no, that's that's very interesting. I, and I appreciate it. So you you basically, you like it happens in security all the time, you've got all these doors locked, but uh, you you don't know about the window that's, that's open. Well, and, and so that, there you are, yes. Yeah, it only takes one. That's the thing is um, now, that one window might lead to a room that's locked and that you can go nowhere, but if, but it might not. Yes, very good. And I, and I appreciate the response. Uh, Ron, there is a question in the chat. I don't know if uh, oh, um, you would like to read it or Carlos. I Diaz can probably like. pull. Um, mm -hmm. How it would be nice to see how OT modifies their risk analysis calculations to import, incorporate cybersecurity how these results are presented to the insurance companies. So, um, okay, so I'm gonna actually go through risk calculations. So first you have, and remember a lot of this is you get somebody who has some level of expertise on something who assigns a probability to an occurrence of an event, and then the probability, and then um, you know, if that event occurs, what is the potential outcome? And what's the risk of other potential outcomes? So what we're talking about is, okay, what's the data so, you know, to, to, to give you what those risks are? Now realize the insurance companies have people who do this for a living, um, you know, that actually assign, assign all these pieces. But when you're doing it, when you're not an insurance, well, um, a, um, now I'm trying to think of the name of the people who do this, they're, um, they basically run the world. Um, you know, the, um, determine the level of risk and assign probabilities to risks. Um, but in doing this on the cybersecurity side, let's say you've got 150 devices, each of which has a 1% chance of being uh, of an intrusion, which will, which will infect at a 10% chance the other ones. We've got a calculation of how we figure out what the overall risk of that is. Um, how do you present them to insurance companies? The insurance companies that do this type of risk analysis tell you many times what they think your risk is based on an actual cyber security assessment. Does that help you? Yeah, the, the, um, one of the things that we're having issues with or where we'll have issues finding internships for some of the students have to do with the insurance. So it would be nice to have some kind of um, plan of action 
when we're looking for these industries to open up their you know, job positions or internship positions for some of our students, how to approach them. So, you know, so, so it would be nice, you know, and it's, it's gotta be the, with this risk assessment, we were, uh, I mean, the, the, the people that we talked so far, it's just they're reluctant because of insurance. So it'd be nice to know what language they're speaking so that we can approach them in a different way and perhaps be successful finding internship for our students. Does that make sense? Okay, well, I'll definitely yeah. put that into one of the future sessions. So, um, yeah, and I, get, get an understanding I, of how. I mean, I don't want to get, I don't want to go into the rabbit rabbit hole of um, of the, all the statistics completely. But uh, that's actually a fascinating. It was. It gets kind of gets into my dissertation because we. I did do. Um, I did risk assessment of um, vulnerabilities of extreme events for my dissertation. So I got um, an entire almost an entire statistics degree and developed a new field of statistics. Hi, I love um, that stuff, but <laughs> not everybody does. Yeah, uh, Luis Gonzalez has another uh, suggestion. Go ahead. Yeah, Luis. I have a, I actually I have a point there from the from the insurance standpoint. Um, it, it's good to know if it's cybersecurity portion of it, also safety. I, I'm in the industry, I'm in the manufacturing and I have also trouble getting students in my facility, specific jobs because of safety requirements, not only cybersecurity, but I, I believe that is not far away that they're going to start asking the same for uh, IT and, and cybersecurity um, education. And with that, I will say I've been looking to see, and maybe this is for colleges and stuff like that, it's kind of like a certification or a uh, a, a seal of or something that the student can present. I went through this training that will mm -hmm. mitigate that risk or that concern from the industry when they're hiring somebody or when they're, when they're letting somebody coming in. Like, like you mentioned about having all the doors locked and the windows locked. Well, our concern is that we open the door to somebody that then it will leave it open. And, and I think that that's one of the things there that is critical for the industry is how we can continue this training being beyond the, the owners and, and things like that. But the students come already with a level that they can be, uh, you know, as part of the interview process is like, yes, I have 16 hours or I have a full course in manufacturing cybersecurity. That will be outstanding to have as part of the industry. Right. And that's actually, because um, you brought up with the safety is, is, is exactly what transfers right over. Because again, you think of it in terms of risk, you're not going to let somebody into your and your plant working there that hasn't been through the safety training and the cybersecurity training. So, um, and one of the things I was going to say is for for mitigating that risk is say, being able to say this student has been through a certified cyber tra uh, cyber uh, training. We go through it here at our school. Every professor is required to complete every semester the cybersecurity training, and we do um, ethical hacking here. We do um, we do targeted spear phishing to see to test people for vulnerability. So I mean, we actually have that yeah. as one of our active protocols. We will get emails from the from a spoof university person to see if we're vulnerable. Yeah, that fake emails are pretty good. We we also do the same in our company and. They're pretty creative and pretty good. I oh, yeah. love doing them because they're fun. That gets back to the good old ethical hacking piece. Um, this is a question that was, was sent directly to me, but um, may benefit everybody. Uh, Professor Yang was asking if the training in January 5th and 6th um, was independent from what Ron's talking about. So the four sessions Ron's doing um, is certainly good. But I think that two days, I mean, it's a 16 hour event pretty much, right? So it's a lot more in depth, I believe. And I think there's more hands on. I don't know, Marilyn, if you've got more info on the fifth and sixth event. But um, sure, if, I mean, this, what Ron's telling us is great. But I think the uh, the intent of the uh, the fifth and sixth was for a deeper dive. Um, right. And I'm actually, I steered away from what they're doing. They're going to get into the nuts and bolts of, how to secure specific pieces of equipment and how to hack into specific pieces of equipment. They're gonna get down into that level. And it's very laboratory, and that one was laboratory based. I ended up, um, because they're also the insight, uh, we're an NSACAE here 
and we work with Insight directly all the time. Yeah, so if you're an educator, certainly um, you know sign up if you're interested, and uh, we can you know get back with you. Yep. And you want right. to mention uh, uh, that is a uh, 500 stipend. I think that's what it is, isn't it, for that particular? Yes, there is a five hundred dollars stipend for uh, for that event. Yeah, thanks, Danielle. Okay, so if there's no other questions, um, thanks again, Ron. Excellent information. Looking forward to the, to the next three. And everybody, keep in mind the other uh, professional developments we have available. And as always, if you have any suggestions for us, or you've got some um, some things that you're doing you want us to uh, participate or learn about, please let us know. Otherwise, you guys have a great week. And we, if we don't see you before then, have a great uh, holiday. And we'll get back with you in January.